You know, David Rockefeller once said at uh, 1994 uh, United Nations Business Council um, that I quote him, we are on the verge of a global transformation. All we need is the right major crisis and the nations will accept the new world order. Now, this is not about conspiracy theory or any kind of woo-woo. It just, um, you know, when we talk about Bitcoin, it's uh, like talking about um, making the holy grail of the central banks, nation state governments and the military industrial intelligence complex obsolete. So I tweeted out yesterday, you know, that it's really time now for mature discussion on the potential chain reactions, cascading effects, whatever you want to call it, from within the literally untouchable so-called national security, military industrial intelligence, corporate complex. Once the holy grail of the criminally immune central banks and wars shall pop with Bitcoin. Now we're still so early, two to three percent mass adoption. That's nothing. It's a drop of a bucket, drop in a bucket. But um, this is why I'm really looking forward to my talk with Alex Vetsky and Giacomo Zucco to talk about, uh, you know, their like what do they think? What are the thoughts? How do how do you, how do they think that's going to play out? What are our options in terms of you know uh, free private cities or jurisdictional arbitrage? Um, circumventing all these, you know, tyrannical uh, Corona Nazi measures, you know, with uh, vaccination passport or uh, being maybe even forced, you know, to take you and your children, you know, the, the gene therapy vaccinations, who knows, you know, what it can cause. I mean, we hear from all kinds of stories that people fall dead or it's like severe side effects or what have you. So, you know, it's a bunch of it's a bunch of topics, bunch of questions we're going to talk about and uh, we're really looking forward to that, really excited. So without further ado, this is my talk with Giacomo Zucco and Alex Vetsky. I'm sure you're going to enjoy this. Hey guys, welcome to the show. Giacomo Zucco, Alex Vetsky. been a long time since you have me in my show, so thanks so much for your time. Hi guys. Buongiorno. <laughs> Buongiorno a tutti. Thanks for inviting me back. <laughs> Uh, yeah, we were just talking about Costa Rica and other places. Um, you guys already had had your uh, gene therapy vaccination shot. <laughs> well, I my family uh, having my my brother is a nurse. Well, basically almost a nurse, and uh, he had to do the AstraZeneca one, and he just had wow. like three days of uh, very high fever. I mean, the, the worst days uh, for his health of the last. Uh, of the past 10 years, but except for that, he's good now. And no, I, 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 I'm, I don't have it. I, I, I didn't have it. Yeah, it's crazy what's going I'll, on. I'll, yeah. I'll be in Antarctica before they give it to me. <laughs> so listen, guys, um, the reason I, I wanted you guys on my show, uh, possibly together with Eric Vasco and Yuri de Gaia, is that there's a question lingering somewhere in the air and I, I have this feeling it's being ignored. Maybe uh, it's because we're so early. I mean, do we ag agree that on the path to whatever, to hyper-Bitcoinization, we're still so early. It's like two to 3% of the world's population know, understand Bitcoin, have adopted, have a hodl Bitcoin. And there's this there's this topic which, which somehow occupies my mind constantly. It's like... Um, you know, what is when when the pain point is reached, when you know, when the this interconnected, you know, deep state, nation state government and the military industrial corporate intelligence complex is somehow um, you know, being really they they feel the pain, you know, that control can be taken away from them. And um I want to discuss with you, I wanna, you know, know your thoughts. What what could the military and I'm going to throw in also uh, Jimmy Song's article today here because he it is somehow related to the military because uh, it's it's about the confis the potential confiscation of um, of mining facilities. He's saying, if I may quote here, he says, "Thus, the operation cannot just be a slow and steady seizure of one mining facility after another." They all have to be seized at once and with significant force. Anyone had the, that has even a hint of what's coming will get their equipment out of the country as quickly as possible. Even something like a prelude, like having to register mining equipment with the government would likely cause a mass ex exodus 
of all but the most unpro unprofitable pieces of mining equipment. Thus, this operation requires a lot of manpower, lots of secrecy, and lots of coordination, probably requiring the military and a lot of violence. Now, I'm not, you know, as you know, I'm not the expert on security architecture and whether, you know, what is really possible or not and what I think my, uh, in, in terms of, of, of you know, of um, state attacks uh, and and the thesis, you know, about, because that's, I think, the, the, the rebuttal of Jimmy Songs to, to some other FUD that's going on. Like uh, if, if miners start like mining empty blocks, maybe you can, you know, uh, 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 elaborate on that, Giacomo, later on. Like, I want to know what is like the worst case scenario? How could the military industrial intelligence complex uh, lash out or react or, or construct artificially conditions in order to make, you know, the lives of the people uh, much, much more difficult beyond recognition? Well, so if I may start, Alex, uh, uh, I think that uh, basically we, ha we have to discuss uh, and separ separately two kind of scenario. One kind of scenario is the uh, like uh, is a blitz against mining in order to block the network now in a very like uh, instant uh, attack, which is basically the, the, the attempt to, to throw Bitcoin into a time chain ice age because if you destroy or confiscate or anyway hijack hash power uh, hash rate in a very consistent fashion then uh, the network will adjust but the network cannot adjust instantly it will adjust basically after many many blocks and only of a uh, of a few percentage of the of the of the collapse of hash power so if, let's assume that you can basically take out uh, 90 percent of the hash power the network will adjust but slowly because they will have to wait for uh, 2016 blocks, which will arrive slowly and so and so on. This, uh, this kind of attack is very, very difficult to perform. Uh, Jimmy explained why. You had to basically organize it and coordinate it across all the globe. You don't know where many mining facilities are. You know about the mining pool, but the ushers are a little bit more distributed. You can track them due to electricity consumption, but not all of them. And even if you do track them, then you, you still have to basically attack them all at once. Otherwise, they will uh, easily escape. And then you need your attacking force, your henchmen, basically, you need them to be beyond corruption because otherwise, instead of destroying the, the machines or just uh, giving them to the authority, they just they just can make them disappear and plug them to the to the uh, electricity network and just mine for themselves. So it's very difficult to do. If they do, if they manage to pull it off, then we still have some kind of uh, uh, counter moves. It's not it's not really. It's just one shot for the government and not even a silver bullet for them because uh, then we can, first of all, the second layer will be mostly undisturbed. It will be disturbed because you cannot settle anymore. But even if you cannot settle, your counterparty, for example, let's assume we have a lightning channel with me. I cannot settle, you can't either. So unless you are in, in collusion with, with the minor disruptors that are mining anti blocks or not mining at all, uh, in all other scenarios, we are you have a symmetrical uh, problem, which is still conserving part of the security model of the second layer. And uh, and in the worst worst case scenario, we can just sort of fork away uh, a new difficulty adjustment. There, there is already in place uh, the proof of work change scenario, which is just a nuclear option. I don't think we will ever use it, but in case of nuclear war, there is the nuclear option of the proof of work change, which is already proposed. The, the optical one by Luke Dasher. But then there is another scenario, which is not a systematic uh, uh, point in time attack, but it's just a growing competition uh, uh, between government sanctioned mining, which will try to mine empty blocks, uh, or KYC blocks, which as I will elaborate, is basically the same as empty blocks, and the free market trying to compete and the, the, the government sanction and mining will be subsidized with taxes, basically, including inflation taxes with, uh, taxes with the fiat. And the, the free market uh, um, uh, blocks will be uh, basically incentivized with mining fees uh, of individual transactors or of collections of transactors uh, chipping 
up together in order to close, for example, a multi-party channel or a, or a liquid uh, uh, peg out or something like that. So you will have the market cooperatively uh, trying to chip in to, to settle on chain. And then you will have uh, the, the state trying to, uh, to basically to subsidize uh, this kind of competition. I think that the first scenario is very, very likely to, to happen and even to really hurt Bitcoin if it happens. While the second scenario, I think is very realistic. And this is mostly the scenario that um, Eric Voskul is, uh, is arguing about. So a, a phase of competition where the state will use taxes to subsidize at lost mining of empty blocks and the market will react increasing uh, competing with the mi mining fee the block fee this is way more realistic it's not certain because even if this is a game theory uh, it, it is a game theory uh, output which is predictable but the fact that it's predictable can make it less likely uh, like if I know that my attack will not succeed I may not Try the, I mean, not to try the attack uh, at all. And also because you don't have the government and the market. You have a, a very complex market network and many governments that can be at competition with each other, which is a great thing to have. Uh, with Coronazis, uh, we have seen a surprising and unprecedented collusion of basically all the government of the world on one objective. This was basically unprecedented. If you exclude maybe, I don't know, not even no, not even heroin and stuff like that. You still had uh, Iran and other. It's unprecedented. Uh, if you have a attack on Bitcoin, which is as coordinated as uh, coronazism uh, and coronazi measures, then you may have this kind of competition problem, and and still not a lost battle. In that case, we have to pay more for settlement because now we have to compete with uh, subsidized empty block producers. Last thing before, before I, I finally shut up and I let Alex respond, I, I don't think that there is a scenario in which KYC blocks are anything significant because uh, all the sanction, sanctioned whitelisted transactions that could enter this kind of state sanctioned blocks uh, and that could basically accept it in all the jurisdiction will basically be the same transactions you could already perform on fiat because basically when government wants to block capital flight and black market and inflation inflation avoidance, uh, if you are not doing any of these trees, uh, basically you can just use fiat. So the, I think the demand for using Bitcoin for stuff that you can easily do with fiat already will be basically zero. So uh, KYC blocks for me at equilibrium basically mean empty blocks is basically the same. Yeah, that's, that's, that's beautiful. Maybe you can talk also about, I want to hear your thoughts, uh, Alex, if you, um, once you add your thoughts to that, like black market, white market, like how can that process develop? Well, I think I, I can't really add anything to what Jimmy said, uh, sorry, to what Giacomo said, because it's, that, that's basically my thesis. I think the, the large scale, the, the first scenario of the large scale coordination is too, too complex, too difficult, too many unknowns. Um, and by, by the time they're ready for it, like the, the mining continues to distribute. Like Nick Carter put out an interesting article today. I haven't read it yet. I've just bookmarked it. But it's, you know, ju just, the, just the stranded power um, that is uh, drawing Bitcoin miners toward it uh, are already starting to, you know, further decentralize the, the mining network anyway. So, so by the time such a coordinated thing was ready, it, you know, they're not dealing with a static target. They're dealing with the with a with a moving target. So, so that kind of diminishes the 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 possibility of the first one. And then, like, you know, to to, to Giacomo's point about the second one, it's a uh, you know, it's it's an it's an empty block attack. So, so you know, I I, I remember I think it was Giacomo said this the first time, or may, maybe Vosco or someone, but it's sort of you know, Bitcoin is black market money, and it 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 always was. And it always will be because what's happening with the market is that through regulation and through the incompetence of regulators and governments and all of this, more and more and more of what we do is black market. I mean, now the black market and criminality means going out and hanging out with your family and, um, and, and being at home like that, that, that's, that's illegal now. So I, I had a friend of mine from Germany and she's like, oh, you know. Uh, for the last couple of weeks, I've been doing some illegal stuff. I'm like, ooh, you're a bad girl. What have you been doing? She's like, oh, just hanging out with my friends. I was like, 
Wow. So it's, you know, I, I think more, more and more things are going to become black market. And as a result, more and more people are going to, to come to Bitcoin as a solution for that. And, and if it's something that they can buy anyway, they're just going to use the, because, because see FinTech as well on the other end is, um, is providing better and better solutions for the so-called white market for people to send money overseas. Like, you know, TransferWise is, is a great product. Um, so it exists. You don't need Bitcoin now necessarily to do international remittance. You can do it with TransferWise and it's fine if you're paying something that is, is a you know, is technically a white market. So, so I just think Bitcoin attracts different things. So it's, it's a bit of an impotent uh, attack vector on their part. And, and I don't know how much it helps them. I think the, the benefit for them is more going to be toward maybe Ben Hunt's argument of trying to productize it and financialize it and, you know, amass a component of the Bitcoin held uh, in the hands of uh, custodians on Wall Street, for example. So instead of, you know, maybe attacking the, the mining network itself is that they try and build up you know, large holders that are not individuals, for example, and, and it's and it's sort of KYC Bitcoin um, in and of itself, as opposed to um, KYC the actual transactions of the network. So, so, so that might be a slightly more feasible. I don't know if Jacqueline has got any thoughts on that. Well, I absolutely agree. I think uh, I think attacking money network directly has the difficulty that that you also mentioned, while attacking uh, the big holders is basically what they did with gold. Uh, the, the process of confiscation of gold during the 30s in the US and in other parts of the world was possible, well, was, was necessary because the state cannot, the current nation state cannot survive hard money, not at the size they are anyway. So yeah. there is the scenario yeah. that many Bitcoiners are, are thinking about a happy hand in which the, the nation state are, just accept the mankind switching back to our money and uh, and yeah, and they just uh, let it go. It's it's actually uh, arithmetically impossible. There is no way mm -hmm. without inflation tax you can sustain the current uh, level of socialist spending. So uh, yeah, it was necessary the confiscation of gold at that time already for those kind of spending that were basically way lower than that today. But it was also possible because most of the people didn't w weren't storing gold uh, physically uh, and even if they were uh, stopping gold from being transferred across borders is easy finding large amount of gold inside a house is easy and uh, with bitcoin is different so um, the, the, the bet of bitcoin is that uh, the the differential in uh, portability and divisibility and storability of bitcoin versus physical gold is so high that even if most people out of convenience right now will go to custodians, when custodians will start to be taxed and over-regulated and shut down and confiscated, then people will have way less resistance to go back to the physical stuff than they had with physical gold. Because physical gold is difficult to use as money in a society like the, the 20th century. Uh, and that's why you have to move to paper gold. Physical Bitcoin, including the Lightning Network, of course, the different layers of physical Bitcoin without custodians are easier to use. And that may change the equilibrium uh, and in order not to repeat uh, the, the Roosevelt situation with Bitcoin. But that said, even if that situation gets repeated, Bitcoin may win anyway. You could, you could have a very effective confiscation of, of Bitcoin as mass scale, but still, uh, do, this will not decrease the price of Bitcoin. This will increase the price of Bitcoin, basically continuing to, dry, to drain resources out of your money into Bitcoin, making ineffective the fiat taxation and the inflation taxation and making basically ineffective taxation to pay for the confiscation. I mean, you have to pay cops to go in homes to uh, confiscate Bitcoin. So there is a very complex feed, feedback loop here that, uh, it, that could... I can see some failure scenarios for Bitcoin, but they become more and more likely every day. While failure scenario for fiat, fiat are basically certain at this point. So the realistic yes. scenario would be what would be, I mean, do you think it's still possible that that mass confiscation could take place? That this is, this is a scenario I want to discuss with you. Like, 
could the you know this this deeply entrenched like nation state in collusion with military intelligence start I mean, inca like threatening, incarcerating, you know, uh, uh, you know, putting ap apply their monopoly on violence, aggression, and um, I mean, on the I mean, people. I mean, they're doing it already, you know. <laughs> that I mean, ask ask to yourself from 2019: Is it possible that they incarcerate people for Facebook posts in Australia or or for having a Christmas dinner in 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 Canada? Uh, it is possible. They can do everything. And as they demonstrated, they can do everything very sh with very short notice. What the, the point is, can they be effective in, in stopping Bitcoin by doing so? And in this regard, I'm way more optimistic. I don't know if Alex is. Uh, as I was on mute. Um, yeah, I, I think in the process of trying, I think they, um, even if they're dumb enough to try. So, so, so th this is the question is, where do they gain potentially more? Is do, do they gain by trying to treat this as another asset class that they can potentially make some money off? Because the, you know the, the way a lot of the decisions are made is that they these these people are leeches. They, they don't they don't add any value. They don't produce anything. Um, you know they they you know when they decide to regulate things, you know what they do is they they come in the middle of a transaction, uh, they make a mess and they say, look at this mess. You need me here to ensure that you two can do something together. So, so they, you know, they sort of try and justify their existence or they see something good going on and, you know, they come like classic racketeers and they say, okay, well, if you want to continue doing this, you need to give me 50% um, or I put you in jail. So, so, so for them, I think it actually makes a lot more sense for them to try and, uh, to try and just tax uh, you know, Bitcoin gains, and 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 to do that, they, they know that they can't really uh, tax Bitcoin once Bitcoin is already in someone's hands. So when you're inside the Bitcoin network, you're in a different world. So so what they'll try and do, I believe, is try and productize and financialize it so that big money comes in, not by holding Bitcoin directly, but through e ETFs or um, other sort of derivative products, which are tied to the US dollar. So people are actually coming in and out of the Bitcoin. Um, and as a result, triggering capital gains, creating flow and all of this sort of stuff. Now, the, 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 the possible risk there is that you have, you know, a potentially like a set of whitelisted Bitcoin, um, which is all custody. Um, it's held by another custodian. You know, people own it, you know, by proxy. And, you know, everyone knows who owns that Bitcoin um, and, and you never really use that Bitcoin on the network itself. It's just sitting there, um, you know, held in custodians. And then you have actual Bitcoin, which has been bought on other exchanges, which has been withdrawn, perhaps coin join this and that. And that's sort of the, the, the majority of the Bitcoin is there. Now, I mean, I don't know the technicalities of this, but does that, does that mean we one day fork off and, you know, mean that the, 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 the white list of Bitcoin that's held in these custodians is one type of Bitcoin and the other is another. Um, and the one that's held in custody is less valuable because it's tainted, for example. Um, I, I don't know what that looks like later. Uh, maybe Giacomo can give a comment to that, but I just don't, I feel like when you look at the, the benefits of trying to shut it down um, versus the benefits of trying to, turn it into something that they can potentially make some money out of because they're, you know, bankrupt and hopeless at, you know, creating anything of value. I feel like that they'll be probably leaning more towards the latter. Um, so yeah. Yeah. So I, I tend to disagree to an extent, meaning that, so first of all, I see this scenario of uh, white Bitcoin and black Bitcoin as not really threatening because uh, as as you said they will there may be at the end two kinds of asset uh, they may make it very difficult to swap between them and eventually they may even censor from blocks uh, the the black transactions and in that case basically we just fork into two different assets and the utility that i see for the white bitcoin for the government sanctioned bitcoin i think is very very low because i assume that is as i said before that is not possible at equilibrium for the governments to basically let an inflation hedge uh, go for everybody. So if I let if if I let everybody protect themselves from inflation tax with Bitcoin, 
then basically inflation tax will fail to be effective to extract mm -hmm. money from the market. And, and, and that's a collapse for, for modern welfare states. So the only alternative is either to let a very, very few people um, doing that, escaping inflation. So basically, I don't just need to track in KYC, but I really need to restrict the market a lot to a very few people. And then the alternative is basically to uh, expand the market to everybody, but to not just regulate the uh, identity issues about uh, about tracking and taxes and, uh, and KYC and AML, but they also have to regulate inflation. Indeed, I think that uh, the more, there is a negative feedback loop there as well. The more governments will succeed into convincing people to follow a compliant version of Bitcoin, including KYC AML, the more politician will be incentivized to try to interfere with monetary policy as well. So uh, right now you have to KYC your Bitcoin, tomorrow you have to KYC your node, and you can only run a node that will basically follow the, uh, the one-time only emergency uh, signature from uh, the, the, uh, the Federal Reserve for uh, increasing, uh, the accepting invalid blocks, increasing the, the supply basically. Because, because the, if the regulator will meet resistance, they will stop. If they don't meet resistance and AML, KYC, capital flight, uh, dark web uh, purchases, then they will expand and they will try to get to the point of uh, uh, monetary policy as well. So if they do, uh, basically, uh, the, the, it's, it's good for Bitcoin because the real Bitcoin, the one that will stay uh, resistant to its uh, monetary principle, will 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 of course go up for the very same reason that Bitcoin is going up in, in fiat terms because the other money is becoming fiat. And if they don't <laughs> include the inflation in Bitcoin, in the white Bitcoin, then they cannot let everybody easily access to that. They have to basically to close the market so much that the black market will flow to the black Bitcoin and the white market will be prevented from flowing into the white Bitcoin. Otherwise, people will escape inflation. So I see that the situation that Alex is describing possible but not long-term, very threatening. Uh, the, the, the part I disagree is that they cannot just accept and, and do nothing, I think. I would divide because, again, it's just nation states are just not sustainable. So I think there are two scenarios in which uh, the governments will not massively attack Bitcoin possession. One scenario is a scenario of uh, uh, disruption of institution. What I mean is that a single politician uh, will care for himself. A single bureaucrat will care for, care for himself. So if they can just buy Bitcoin and be happy, like uh, late Soviet Union uh, oligarchs, they, 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 they are seeing the dissolution of everything. And so they just grab stuff and, and, and put themselves and their family at, uh, in, uh, in, uh, in safe, but they don't care for the institution, then they can just get along with Bitcoin. So uh, welfare state will collapse uh, uh, retirement funds especially will collapse. Uh, all the retirement uh, Ponzi scheme will, will, will tragically collapse without inflation. Um, military spending will collapse. You will have basically a rollback of social spending back to the beginning of 20th century, if not more. And then single politicians and single bureaucrats in charge, they will just escape from the system which is already uh, collapsing. This is a likely scenario. So they don't attack Bitcoin because it's too late, basically. The other scenario is that uh, you, you will basically have a fraction between nation states that can maintain their current level of spending without an inflation tax, which currently, I think, are basically oil-based states like Dubai, mm -hmm. uh, maybe a few states within the United States could survive out of natural resources they control, or maybe you are Panama, you just, you just tax... The, the Panama Canal and you're and you're ready to go. If you are Egypt, you could tax Suez, but but uh, first you have to solve a problem. And then if you, <laughs> if you can just uh, if you can keep rent seeking at your current level without inflation tax, you can you can basically uh, indulge in ignoring Bitcoin. Otherwise, as an institution, you have to crush it to to keep your current spending. As individuals within the institution, you may not care. If uh, if everything is already falling down. 
So let me ask you, Jack, because this is a really fascinating point you brought up. So, uh, so as you know, whatever we think about, you know, institutional adoption, I think it's good in the long term. You know, like like they're sort of um, they are benefiting some of the whole process. But as more institutions, you know, as the trillions are coming in and ma- you know mass adoption of uh, of of you know uh, it's becoming more mainstream. Is because there's this talk about defunding the state. So is this the process of defunding the state, and with that, you know, the defunding of the military-industrial complex? Is is that is that the way to go, or or, or long term? I mean, switching to Bitcoin is the way to defund, because again, most of the expenses of modern national states, including military and stuff like that, are inflation-based. You cannot get that just taxing houses. It's, it's just an order of magnitude or more. So is the, it is the way. Inflation purchases are are good. Uh, we can welcome them. They are just very fragile because when I mean I think that when the government will go to uh, to Michael Saylor to take all his Bitcoin, he will be smart and use plausible deniability and boating accidents. But I think that when the state will go to MicroStrategy to take all the Bitcoin, you cannot have a company. Uh, it doesn't even make sense to have a company boating accident because you, uh, the, the concept of the company right now is very, the institutions are very regulated. So they cannot even really profit from hidden funds. Uh, very small companies may do that. Like uh, you, you pretend to be at loss, but just like cover up business that are basically similar to current, uh, you know, the cover up for a drug cartel. And then you pretend you have a business going bad and instead you actually have Bitcoin and you're go- doing great. And you, but you cannot do that at, at the um, a New York Stock Exchange scale, I think. So, is it, so uh, adopting Bitcoin is the fund in the nation state and uh, institutional adoption is good. It's just that it, it is also efficient and fast, and I think it will be very fast this year uh, in, in the next months, but it's fragile because it's centralized. Everything which is centralized is mm-hmm. fast, mm-hmm. cheap, uh, effective, but fragile. So I think we should just welcome it, even because we cannot stop it, but be prepared that when shit is the fun, uh, companies will easily... Uh, fold to the power of the of God. Hey Alex, what do you think about me? Is this the speculative attack? Like, which is uh, I don't know whoever was the first one, Pierre Rochard, whoever brought that up first time. Like, is that could that be taken as a justification? You know, for national security measures. You know, I, I don't think so. I think I think it's not a. My my guess is, I, and I used to talk about this idea of like the the greed to arrogance, um, like a greed to arrogance framework, which is whilst you know people like the u.s government and everything for, for them to admit that something like bitcoin is a threat to their government they, they sort of lower themselves to the status of you know the nigerian finance minister who's complaining that oh we can't stop this um so i think it's like a you know it, it's an admittance of some form of defeat and and i just don't think they're ready for that so i think they're too arrogant to sort of um to go down that path to call it a to call it a real threat there is some idiots like you know obviously chuck schumer and stuff like that which i maybe shouldn't call an idiot because he actually gets it um so you know he 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 sees the writing on the wall but you know i think most most others are not they're not going to be like well look you know that that's like saying you know a small island of you know indians are a threat to the greatest nation in the world so so i don't, so I don't know um that part. So, so at, at the same time, so while you've got this arrogance, you've also got this greed, which is, you know, what I described earlier is this this desire to to tax it because it's sort of the the, the easiest thing you can do. Uh, like if you're a government, if you're a nation state, and you want to do something with this, is you know you you get together with your pals in Wall Street and central banking and everything. And we say, look, we can't really stop this. You know, we don't really want to, you know sound the alarm that we've sort of been defeated or that we you know a couple nerds have like managed to you know build something stronger than us so let's let's just productize it and let's tax the shit out of it and let's just make sure that people don't actually get custody of their bitcoin let's just make it a financial product so that way they have a us dollar equivalent of bitcoin and as they go in and out you know we will make a shitload of money and i think that that's uh essentially what they'll um what they'll try and do but as Giacomo said um the 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 benefit of that is 
that it grows Bitcoin's network value and it makes the rest of Bitcoin that is actually held in Bitcoin more and more and more valuable. It, it dampens the volatility. As the volatility dampens, Bitcoin starts to emerge more and more as a, um, as a more useful medium of exchange um, because then more people decide to accept it um, or to use it as payment. Um, as that occurs, more and more things become illegal. Uh, so, you know, buying meat, for example, will probably one day be black market, um, you know, a black market transaction as they try and feed everyone soy and bugs. Um, so, so, you know, we, we sort of start to create these networks of, you know, all right, well, now we use Bitcoin for this and this and this. Whilst the institutions are actually holding up the price for us um, in buying dollar equivalents uh, of Bitcoin um, and, you know, in, in enabling that. Now, as that continues to occur, uh, you know, more and more money sort of floods out of uh, fiat and continues to sort of flow into Bitcoin in some way, shape or form which further then weakens the, the most important element of, or the most important tool of the nation state, which is, as Jaco mentioned, the, the inflationary money printer. Because, I mean, they can tax as much as they want, but really where they make all the money is by uh, printing the shit. Um, that, that's, that's far more effective than tax. So they're kind of, they're kind of stuck here. And, and, and I think, as that happens, you, you've also got probably one other piece to think of is these bureaucrats don't really give a shit about the nation state. Um, you know, the, the, you know, there might be career bureaucrats and career politicians, but they're more so interested in what they can gain while they're in power. And if that's the case, like, fuck it, I'll gain what I can now. And then later on, eh, whatever, so, someone else will deal with it. And, and that in, in a, in a, that's less probably manifest in a in an emerging society or a society that's strong that's sort of still in the um you know in the first or second season like you know strong men create good times um you know and good times sort of but we're sort of definitely in a decaying thing we're, we're in the in the uh weak men creating bad times um and you know we're going to be if not in the bad times already you know somewhere in there and 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 what that means is you, you you get this kind of Soviet slash you know what happened also in Iran uh, when they you know when they replaced the sheikh and all this sort of stuff like you, know, you get this sort of turmoil where no one gives a fuck about the the society anymore the institutions they're just sort of in it for themselves um, and they're trying to flee and trying to structure now I don't think we're there yet but we it's not like the US is becoming a better power at the moment you know it's not becoming a better place to live it's not it's not the promised land anymore it's not it's not any of that um and and i just don't think that i don't know i i would hate to be in this situation honestly the, the, i i think there's there's so many battles to fight on so many fronts uh it's like you know bitcoin is just another thing and it's you know, where to put the resources into what direction without fucking it up and, you know, making Bitcoin stronger in the process is a, it's a hard question for them to answer. I don't know how they do it. Like they can hurt Bitcoiners individually, but, you know, pr probably, probably to their own detriment um, in the medium to long term. So, uh, Do you see like more... Like if we just stay in the United States, I mean, you know, there's like super like ethical, let's say I, I'm going to call them ethical uh, politicians or decision makers like Cynthia Lummis and Congress people, you know, Warren Davidson, you know, these people. Do you, do you see like an acceleration of, of, of people within the political structures, you know, becoming more and more or coming in and you know, uh, adopting Bitcoin and, and, and uh, uh, advocating Bitcoin and trying, you know, to... Uh, sort of help the, the process of hyper bitcoinization probably i mean I, I don't see why not the the other thing we've also got on our side is time is because you know the next generation of people are growing up and you know the the sort of the millennials and the, those younger than us who are, you know are, are more prone to to understand and you know want to adopt something like bitcoin and want to seem progressive and things like that 
they're the ones who over the coming decade are going to be potentially coming into office and stuff like that. Now, they might naively think that oh, yep, I'm a, I'm a pro-Bitcoin senator or pro-Bitcoin governor and I'm going to save the United States by helping us enable Bitcoin. They, they may not understand the mathematics of uh, large nation states and inadvertently, um, you know, act as a as a force to minimize state damage in the short term thereby uh, creating you know, major damage to the state in the long term uh, whilst naively um, assuming that Bitcoin is going to make America great again, which it's not. <laughs> um, so I think that, that, that that's an interesting one. I don't know, Giacomo, what do you think there? Yeah, I think that the paradox is that the Bitcoin network as a whole is basically impossible to seriously hurt in a in a case of a war against Bitcoin. But single Bitcoiners, as Alex said, uh, can actually be hurt. Uh, companies, uh, uh, individuals, uh, advocates, uh, we could be just hurt about this kind of turn of events. But Bitcoin itself is just made stronger by 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 a full frontal attack. On the other hand. The nation state as an institution with its current spending, military and social security spending cannot accept not attacking Bitcoin if Bitcoin works because it's just an existential threat to the level of spending we have today. But, see, but on the other way around, single politicians and single bureaucrats will probably be more than happy to accept the, uh, the, the, the collapse of the current spending level and the collapse of the current uh, social security or or uh, warfare, welfare, welfare institutions, if they can profit themselves. And that can be divided into categories. They, 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 you have the corrupt politician that will just want to profit from a, a very selfish point and purely economic point of view, just grabbing some money for himself and or, or local power or whatever. And then you could also have the ethical ones that will actually profit uh, politically from some kind of pro-Bitcoin stance uh, in a world where Bitcoiners are getting richer and influ more influential and stuff like that. So you have the senator, but you also have the, the major of uh, Miami and you have a similar situation in Switzerland. You have a few majors that are super pro-Bitcoin and uh, and maybe a few people starting to also infiltrate the, the board in Bern. So that can happen. And um, I, I think the point is exactly what Alex said. If institutions are, if collective and collectivistic institutions are very, very strong, then they will consider Bitcoin an existential threat and they will try to attack frontally. And they will have to, they will have no other choice. If uh, institutions will be crumbling and collapsing and uh, shrinking and, and basically mm, uh, uh, getting more soft and less strong, then single individuals in power, they may have a convenience into just uh, staking sets and maybe getting along with Bitcoin and, si and, and basically jumping on the, on the car of the victorious uh, asset. And so uh, the, 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 the happy hand scenario uh, and the peaceful transition scenario is not impossible, but it will require, in my opinion, a fast, very fast disgregation of the institutional level. Uh, so you, you basically have everybody for himself and when you have everybody for itself, it's the, 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 the game theory equilibrium is basically mostly pro-Bitcoin, one way or the other. Well, when you have the institution, uh, Bitcoin is an existential threat. So I, I totally agree that good politicians uh, and Bitcoiner, Bitcoin friendly politician may be a, an example of this kind of disgregation dis where, where you have basically everybody for himself. Because otherwise in a strong institution, uh, you cannot have a senator the, uh, saying we should adopt Bitcoin and make America great again because Bitcoin can make American society great again and American market great again, but it cannot even keep the federal government as great as it is now. Bitcoin working would have to shrink the spending of the, of the federal government. That's, that's just mathematic. So either you have a very, very bad at math uh, major or, or senator or they cannot seriously think that Bitcoin can make federal spending just even as great as it is now. So as we see um, the tendencies, you know, I mean, history seems to be repeating itself. We are at a tipping point where it's uh, not yet, but hyperinflationary, you know, tendencies could come into play. Uh, 
what kind of role does that play? The, you know, the, the trillions that are being printed or digitally or <laughs> physically by, by central banks, what, what, what kind of, like, how does it contribute to this whole process? Okay, is, okay, I will go first. Uh, for, for once that I'm not super talkative. <laughs> so I think that we, uh, we, uh, we know that inflation is going to come. It's just a mathematical certainty because basically when you print more money, uh, cheater is parable. So if you don't have more demand for money and you increase the supply of money, the, the, the purchasing power of money has to go down. So you have, have to see inflation. There are a few reasons you may not see inflation always and everywhere. The first reason is, is that sometimes, but that's not the time anymore, clearly, the growth of the market will increase the demand for money. So the growth itself will mask, will hide a little bit of the, of the, monet, of the purely monetary inflation. So if the market is growing more than the monetary mass, then you don't see strong inflation. The second reason may be geopolitical and geographical because many countries can actually export inflation. You can have the USA is printing, printing a lot of dollars, but then dollars being using out abroad more and first. So the country loan effect is not, is not like homogeneous across the globe. You, you print more and then it depends where the new, newly printed money goes. And the third reason is not geographical, but is market wise. If you print in order to, and, and you give the printed money to people in order to buy stocks and bond, especially government bonds, then you will sh mostly see an increase in prices in that market that had been attacked the first. And only later, you will see some kind of osmosis reaching the rest of the economy. So you will basically see uh, stock markets. Uh, if the Fed prints to buy stocks, you will see stocks going up. And you will call it economical growth. When, when a chapter 11 company is increasing uh, the price of its share, but that's exactly monetary inflation localized in the market where, where money went before, uh, went first, and then it will uh, actually go uh, uh, out. I think that the, 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 uh, right now, even we are not even in this phase anymore. We, it's true that monetary inflation is mostly concentrated in, in stocks and regulated market and government bonds, but it's already since many decades uh, dribbling, and especially now in uh, houses, cars, uh, education, tuition, medical, medical services, healthcare, everything which is basically, the, the governments are basically fixing a, a, a basket of goods and services, and there's a very small basket, and they're trying everything they can to, uh, to control the prices within that basket, but everything else is going up including Bitcoin, which is going up for increase of adoption, but also for monetary infl inflation. So uh, inflation is here. You cannot hide it anymore inside of this market. Eventually, it will hit the traditional measured baskets in a way that would be very, very difficult to hide uh, just playing with the basket itself and just reducing the goods so that you can keep uh, pretending you have uh, you have 2% uh, inflation every year. Uh, and I think that would be a very good uh, signal that uh, that that stuff is happening. The, there could, could there be some kind of uh, mask, some kind of narrative masking that. I mean, maybe yeah, again we were joking about the, the Suez Canal. Uh, we can say that oil is going up a lot because of. I mean, there is always a narrative, right? There is always something that can explain away what is happening from the monetary point. But the monetary point is very very clear. If you increase the supply of money, uh, cheater is parables with the demand, you will have price inflation. You just cannot avoid it. Alex, what are your thoughts on that? Still here? Alex? <laughs> I'm sure if you can hear us. So... Uh, ta tax taxes in, in, in South America are so low that they cannot provide a good infrastructure. Without socialism, you cannot have good infrastructure, even <laughs> for the internet. <laughs> Okay, so um, sorry, I'm here, I'm here, I'm here, I'm here. Oh, I'm here okay, I'm here. sorry, guys. <laughs> sorry, b before I was trying to say something, I was on mute, but this time for some reason the mute button wouldn't stop, uh, wouldn't work. Um, I, I mean, I, I don't really know what else to add to that. I, I'm, I'm happy to answer like a, a follow on question because I think what Giacomo said is, I mean, spot on. They're, they're always going to explain everything away. Um, the, the only thing I would uh, uh, counter to Giacomo's point is um is you know I, I read on Bloomberg the other day that CPI has still not hit two percent, which means we don't have inflation. 
So how could you lie? How could you say something like this? Uh, I'm joking. Uh, just for the record. Okay. <laughs> Jack, I was like, wait a minute. I was, what? I mean, how, uh, uh, how is possible that these people are lying? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, men but can also, have babies, okay? Just remember that. <laughs> yeah. It's not just about, uh, as uh, this is also a good point. I was just uh, mentioning playing with the basket. So you just reduce the basket so you hide inflation. But you can just, I mean, why do you want to play with baskets when you can just play with words? It's just that you yeah, call yeah. 2% uh, uh, inflation, you call it deflation. And then you just keep calling everything which is not 100% inflation, you call it deflation. And, mm -hmm. and there you go, you don't have inflation anymore, even in the, in the controlled basket. Yeah, it's a, it's, a, it's a game. It's no longer tied to reality. Uh, I'm actually writing a piece now um, where I'm going to be talking about how what, what we've done in this sort of crazy drive towards making everything in the world, uh, uh, you know, we, we've got this drive to only think about matter and not what matters. Um, and, and this is sort of, a, I guess, a, an echo of the scientific revolution, which in many ways was good. It's, it's sort of said, look, let's not think too much about ethics and philosophy and all that sort of stuff, because that's, that's a bit metaphysical and a bit esoteric. Let, let's just study, you know, what matters. And we sort of, we've been overrun by this, uh, this empirical viewpoint um, of everything. And then, you know, what, what idiots have tried to do along the way is they've tried to make everything uh, an empirical study from, you know, economics to psychology to philosophy and everything. You know, it's something that has to be measured. But the problem is because the real world is too complex to measure, they decide to uh, make everything um that doesn't fit into the model, either discard it or make an assumption about it, which the assumption doesn't relate back to reality. So, so the, in order to make the models work, so it's like, let's ignore reality so that we can have a model that supposedly, you know, is to tell us something about reality, but never mind that we just ignored all the other real stuff. And then let's build society around this false model because we're just gonna assume all of this stuff doesn't matter. And then we, we behave and we live like society becomes this deranged melting pot of actions being taken by individuals, organizations, and everything that don't actually map back to reality. And we wonder why everything's gone so fucking crazy. And, and, and that's sort of where we are now. It's like, you know, inflation doesn't mean anything anymore like cpi doesn't mean anything more these baskets don't mean anything more so it's all just a game of words pretending like gravity doesn't exist and we're sort of like wily coyote at the moment is we've run off the side of the hill and we don't realize that there's nothing left below us and you know there'll, there'll come a point where we look down and then adios it's gonna be it's gonna be ugly you know, the original uh, purpose of, of, of why I, I wanted you to on this show is to, like, there's this vast power structures and um, especially the military industrial combat, like, how, when would they feel provoked to, you know, to provoke something, like to, to, uh, to incite something or would it be false flag or, you know, construct like artificial conditions and um, because they're not just going to, you know, let go you know, of the of mm -hmm. power structure. And so this is what I'm some, somehow, maybe it's a long-term view because we're still so early and, you know, they don't give a fuck right now about Bitcoin or the Bitcoiners. But uh, as it is, you know, progressing so fast, I'm like, what's, what's, what could happen like in 10, 20 years from, from, from now on? Um, are they going to start a war or, or are they going to start like, you know, um, start establishing a militarized police state? Uh, what, what, what's the game here? You know, I think that happens much earlier than 20 years. But, but I think I think the actual game is like I, I was reading When Money Dies recently. And and I guess if people want to know why Hitler emerged, you, you don't sort of look at Hitler, you look at the Weimar Republic and the clusterfuck that Germany was uh, in the lead up to Hitler. And, 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 you know, he, he was, he, he came in as someone with confidence to say, look, fuck it. This is what we're going to do. We're going to make, you know, uh, Germany great again, basically. And, you know, because the idiots that came before completely wrecked everything, but 
what he erroneously did was instead of um, pointing the finger at like, you know, the money print or anything like that, what, what he did was he pointed the finger at the beneficiaries who were intelligent enough to protect their own wealth um, and also get wealthy in the process. So, so I actually think that the bigger risk here is, you know, what potentially the military industrial complex and governments and state and whatever do to individual Bitcoiners, because that again, they have more to gain by, I mean, if I was a government, I would be trying to buy Bitcoin really quietly. And then I would go around and start killing Bitcoiners um, because, you know, when, when, a, when a Bitcoiner dies, uh, we kind of sacrifice our monetary energy into the network because, you know, that Bitcoin is then even further more scarce. So, you know, if, if you're, if you're a, you know, large scale government now, th this is a scary situation is don't like, you know, help make Bitcoin uh, broad um, or sorry, not, not make Bitcoin broad, help, help. Bitcoin financialize and grow in power, but kill off anyone else who's holding Bitcoin <laughs> and that has a dissenting voice. Now that's that's a risk again, not to not to Bitcoin, but a risk to to Bitcoiners, which that is probably definitely cause for concern. And and that requires you know Bitcoiners to really think about things like privacy and you know uh, having jurisdictional arbitrage in terms of where they live and where they are. Like it's um. I, I don't know. Um, you know, Francis and I were having a discussion about this and saying, look, you know, we, we sort of need to outlast the the clusterfuck that's happening. And, and I think Bitcoin's going to be one problem in a series of all sorts of other problems. Um, you know, the the more quiet Bitcoiners are, the, the less of a target we sort of paint on our own backs. So I think that kind of stuff is important. Unfortunately, people like me and Giacomo, are, uh, and sorry, I'm going to put words in your mouth here, but we're, we're incredibly stupid by making ourselves public Bitcoiners and, you know, saying all the things we say um, and you too, Kevin, <laughs> it's like, we're, we're all, we're all idiots here because, you know, we've sort of painted uh, clear targets on our backs. So, so, you know, we, we might all have to exit into the nearest jungle and, um, and, and hide for the next five years, you know, as this clusterfuck, you know, falls, but, but I, I just don't, I think that's the attack vector. Is, is you attack Bitcoiners. You hold Bitcoin and you attack Bitcoiners. Um, you know, the, the the Nazis held the gold and they killed the Jews. Um, so, so maybe that's a good analogy. Yeah, I very much agree. I think that, uh, yeah, again, the Bitcoin is decentralized and so it is anti-fragile. We as individuals, we are necessarily centralized in our physical body and with, with families and countries. And, uh, and we are way more fragile than Bitcoin itself. So, and it was in a way pretty stupid to become public figures about Bitcoin. That said, uh, somebody was, there is, there is a space for this kind of uh, uh, community uh, work that we do. This, this community uh, mechanism are emerging anyway. Some guy will take this position or speak about Bitcoin with other people. And uh, so maybe there are way there are many people, many Bitcoiners that are smarter than me and, and you and Alex, and we just don't know that they are here because they just have the, they are smart enough to, to shut up. But, uh, but eventually this, this void is to be, uh, to be filled. If, if I was thinking back uh, right now, if I'm thinking back right now, I would probably not have done it. Uh, right now, the opportunity cost of shutting down is, uh, is higher than, than, than not because uh, anyway, my target is already there. I think it's still a significantly small target, but I don't think that shutting down now and getting quiet now will significantly change my situation in five years. So I, I am more about, I, at this point, uh, my, my personal priority is to increase my security, to make sure that everybody knows that first, I don't have any Bitcoin, of course. And second, if I even had some sets, uh, it will be easier to, uh, to basically find a honest job than, than to waterboard me into releasing uh, <laughs> a, a, ch a, check, a check sequence verify, which I cannot because the network cannot release a check sequence verify. So uh, the point is, the point is just I, I will have to make to work and to spend money into uh, make it believable for attackers because otherwise I, I get waterboarded for for a long time before I can. <laughs> I can just uh, uh, sign a, a, an invalid, I, I can get a CSV transaction mined. 
So um, jokes aside, I agree. Uh, individual Bitcoiners, especially advocates, may be a uh, target soonish, and the Bitcoin network will not care at the end of uh, and, and the end. And uh, yeah, I think that the first question you ask is a war or a police state? I think I don't know. I am surprised that mm, that mm, wars are not a thing at a mass scale since a lot of time. But at this point, given the current equilibrium, I think that police state uh, is way more um, way more likely than the war. I maybe uh, these are kind of things that happen very very fast. They like uh, uh, coll collective hysteria uh, explodes very fast, like we have seen with coronazism. It can explode the same with uh, uh, I don't know. Let's kill the Chinese. Let's kill the Americans. Let's kill the Jews. That can explode immediately. But um, the, the current trend is toward centralization of, of state power. Uh, so it, it's, it's true that maybe Biden is calling Putin a murderer, but still the situation right now is, is more and more towards this kind of interwined centralized power, uh, which is getting global. Uh, and I don't see a lot of um, polarization there is China and the U.S., but the U.S. is closer to China than it ever was in its history. Like part of the, the, some U.S. states are basically adopting um, uh, healthcare, public healthcare strategies that are explicitly mutated from the Chinese Communist Party. And you now have the, 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 the leadership, the political leadership of the United States federal government, which is pretty close with the Chinese uh, ideology and, uh, and power structure. So... I don't see a very easy scenario in which you 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 create uh, a, a traditional state-to-state uh, -state war. Maybe I'm going to say something crazy now, but maybe that would be even better in a way because war is a tragedy, but it creates some kind of competition. So if you uh, war is the health of the state because the citizens, where they are scared, the subjects, they will accept anything because they are scared of the enemy, which is coming to invade, they are coming to, to, to steal and rape and compete. So you are scared and you will accept any bullshit. So war, emergency of war, was always the typical narrative to increase government power. Indeed, mm -hmm. even fiat money was possible mostly because it was needed for war. So you have to allow me to, to print to the base because I need it for war. So war is the typical narrative. But it creates the enemy outside, which is against the design of progressive centralization into the European Union and then the, the, the Atlantic side and then the uh, uh, United uh, uh, Nations organization. And this kind of pressure of centralization is probably stronger than the current pressure to create, to create the enemy. So I still see violence, but probably mostly like... Uh, inner violence, like something closer to a civil war, maybe, uh, or to a persecution of, of uh, classes of citizens within the, the, the nation state network than without. I don't see the, I don't see the blocks of, of, of a new war right now. 100, 100% what Jacqueline said that I want to echo is that um, like a, 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 an overt war with, um, with another nation state at this point is just crazy Un unless you're some you know poor fucking arab state that doesn't have any infrastructure so you know we'll bomb you because no one's going to be able to know anything and no one really gives a fuck anymore because everyone's too concerned about you know what kim kardashian did yesterday so it's like that that stuff is um is i think just like two 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 larger powers or two powers with any significant um strength are not going to go to war because it's just going to be too damaging that there's it's just, it's completely pointless. But waging a war against a phantom enemy, so like, I mean, the the war on the fucking virus, for example, like that. That's a that's a that's a typical example of the 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 changing nature of war warfare and and what it's actually become today. Is it's it's no longer, um, you know, a, a war against uh, you know a, a, another sovereign. It's this. It's this thing that apparently is going to get us all. It's going to kill us all. And now if you're a dissenting voice, you're part of that enemy. Um, and then you sort of get labeled with that. And, and, and I mean, that, that's got echoes of pre-World War II as well. Um, you know, it's, it's again, it's the, the, the Jews and the gypsies and whatever. And it's sort of like the, 
the the Marxist class warfare sort of thing. But you know, it, it's it's just the it's the same thing, but just the new new fresh coat of paint. You know, it's a it's the it's the you know, whilst history doesn't repeat, it rhymes, and and we're seeing the just the same shit play out again. Um, and it's just far more convenient. Like again, bureaucrats are lazy. They they, they don't want to do what's hard. Fuck that. You know, they, they just want to do the most convenient thing. And I think the most convenient thing is to to call, you know, anyone who questions the vaccine, uh, a conspiracy theorist, anyone who, you know, questions the government, uh, a terrorist, um, you know, anyone who uses Bitcoin as a financial terrorist um, and a money launderer and a child rapist or whatever, um, whilst they themselves do all the pedophilia, money laundering, <laughs> thieving and everything that they say, you know, others do. So it's a, yeah, I think it's a far more carve out groups, blame them, you know, hit individuals that might sound like a dissenting voice, hit them hard so that we can make an example out of them. Like Ross Albrecht is a perfect example of someone who, you know, they try to make a real example out of. But I mean, on a, on a, on a medium to long-term scale, they lose. It doesn't matter. It's just, you know, we, in, in a, in a selfish, uh, self-preservation type um, standpoint is, you know, you, you want to look after yourself in an individual capacity because, you know, a, a, as a Bitcoiner, I, I do want to see the other, uh, I want to see the light at the end of the tunnel. I don't want to be end up in fucking Guantanamo Bay beforehand. Yeah, to be honest with you, I mean, this is something really what concerns me. I mean, you know, Giacomo, you uh, yourself, parents uh, with, with Mia and, we will sort of, I'm, I'm still, you know, I mean, I told my girlfriend, you know, as soon as we can afford it and we are independent of, I would, I, we would definitely emigrate to, you know, to whatever it's called, free private city or some kind of localized community where we have, we can enjoy like the, 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 you know, the, uh, the, the, the freedom of life, you know, and, uh, and what, especially, you know, you just mentioned, you know, this, this whole vaccination uh, madness, I mean, this is something which which really uh, scary because uh, if they, you know, if the government or whatever uh, the nations can can force you to take uh, gene therapeutical vaccinations, uh, otherwise, I mean, it's going to start probably in 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 steps. You know, like you can't travel out or in and out without a vaccination pass. So to wrap this up, I mean, just my final uh, question to you guys is. How do you see like more as to, to go back to our first topic? Like, do you see more of those free private cities or uh, uh, free economic zones or whatever you want to call them evolving uh, because of this uh, jurisdictional arbitrage? Is, I think it's also called. Well, um, uh, like, oh, yeah, you, you go first, Jackman. Okay. So um, I think that the ideas the idea that we had in the in, in the early 2000s uh, me at least of uh, like you know seasteading or private city startup city uh, free economic zone like the ones in china is actually also going in uh, also facing a counter tendency like uh, uh, hong kong so you, you i was thinking back in the 2000 out of economic efficiency more and more little uh, chunks of territory will try to secede and become like Hong Kong. And right now we see Hong Kong falling uh, under the, the basically under the hammer of communist China. And uh, and and Catalonia, they, they just did a, a referendum. They won independence, just like uh, it happened with uh, uh, Kosovo or uh, or uh, or Yugoslavia back then. Or, or especially the most peaceful example was a uh, uh, Czech Republic and uh, and, uh, and Slovakia Republic. And, uh, and I was like, okay, maybe that could happen in uh, Catalonia as well. Uh, maybe tomorrow even in Texas, uh, uh, if, uh, uh, if I'm not dreaming too much, but not really, right? Uh, the, the Spain government would just send police to, uh, to, to beat uh, up old ladies uh, taking a vote and, and nobody will care eventually. And, uh, and China will take over Hong Kong. So the idea of explicit uh, challenge to uh, the process of uh, uh, centralization of nation states will probably not be allowed. 
uh, it will be restricted even more now because there are even more reasons because, okay, you want a free state uh, project, but what about COVID? I mean, I, we cannot allow you to, be, to do, have different rules for, for this kind of health uh, crisis and emergency. And then there is terrorism. And then there is, again, as Alex said, you have drugs, you have child abusers, and uh, we, we cannot allow that. That said, uh, the, more, the more centralized the power becomes, the more uh, weak and fragile it becomes, especially at the margins within uh, is such a structure. So the, while you have the empire growing, you see weakness inside the structure of the of the empire. So maybe an explicit challenge like uh, independence, sovereign territory. That's I, I don't think that's very realistic. But uh, stuff like de facto private cities, like uh, uh, like uh, I don't know a touristic village or uh, or a big hotel or a big uh, right now when I, when I'm traveling right now I go to hotels and they are recreating the same condition of a normal functioning society within the hotel especially if they are very big you will just people doing stuff eating and doing normal stuff they are they are just collapsing within small chunks of small bubbles basically so the the the, the place the state that will just grant our freedom and we will move there I I'm skeptical but a network of many, many hotspots of relative freedom, which may not even be sanctioned by laws. I can see a situation where we are actually moving, moving in an area which formally has even worse restriction, but because we know that within this kind of community, with this kind of people with the right amount of money that I pay, I will be protected. So I see it more, more local, more case by case, less explicit, less uh, uh, less uh, like idealistic. It's not about uh, let's create a new state, Liberland or uh, or or, or Isola delle Rose, but it will be more like uh, let's just travel in this nice resort, and it just so happens that the owners of this resort are my friends, and I give them money, and they give me freedom and protection from henchmen all around, official and unofficial. My my, I, I've got a. Um, so, so I think that is uh, definitely more important in the short term. I think in the in, in the medium term, I think where there's going to be opportunity is the the smaller uh, governments who are traditionally far more incompetent. Um, so, you know, small South American countries, small Eastern European countries, where the the possibility to uh, let's call it uh, incentivize um, their, their, their politicians and things like that to, to do things who, who they themselves don't have the, the printing power of a United States government or of, a, of, a, um, or of an ECB or anything like that. They're going to be the ones who are most prone to saying, fuck me, we're broke, we can't feed ourselves. Um, you know, for God's sakes, the ECB, the euro and the US dollar are collapsing. You know, we're, we're completely collapsing here. They have all their own problems. They're not giving out any more aid. We need something. I think there's going to be some real opportunities for us as uh, particularly Bitcoiners who, you know, are going to benefit monetarily from this whole clusterfuck uh, over the coming decade is we will be able to either lease land um, or, you know, buy, buy stuff to, to be able to um, build these kind of like private cities or these enclaves and things like that. So I think that's possible. Now, it won't mean that we're initially sovereign. Um, it'll probably be like a, an arrangement where we pay a percentage of our total earnings inside the, the enclave to these idiots, um, or we just pay a flat rental rate or something like that. Because these guys like what we've got to realize is that you know wh while the state is the state it's it's run by people so so there's there's deals to be made and it's harder to make a deal with um you know biden because he's going to forget the deal 30 seconds after you told him but you know you it's easier to make a deal with you know some you know who was that guy who was running nicaragua back in the day when pablo escobar was around I can't remember his name but anyway um uh, it, it, th that's the kind of things I think will be able to exist. Now, you, you do have some challenges. Like wh where that's different to Hong Kong, for example, is Hong Kong is next to China for fuck's sake. And China is, 
you know, a, an extreme threat. So it doesn't like Hong Kong had no chance because of its proximity. Um, Hong Kong only ever had a chance. Like they fucked up by uh, letting the British leave. Like if, if they didn't do that, then it would have been China against Britain. But because it was China against, hey, this is our thing anyway, um, all you guys did was sign a 99 year lease, um, you know, we're, we're sort of taking it back. That there was very little, uh, you know, opportunity there. But let's say, for example, I'll use a shit country like, uh, let's say Kosovo. Um, they don't have much of an army, man. Like they, they don't have much of anything. So, you know, a bunch of wealthy Bitcoiners come there. They say, look, we're going to carve out this section of the land here. You know, we're going to grow. We're going to do stuff. We've got our own private police, our own private protection. We're going to pay you for, for leasing this uh, thing. Um, you know, if they want to come and sort of take it, they might try it, but it doesn't make a lot of sense because they're making money out of us um, and they won't be able to put the force of, you know, tanks and everything else that China did uh, in comparison. To them. We'll, we'll probably have more money than they will. Um, and slowly by slowly, we sort of like take more and more. So, so I think that there's going to be some interesting arbitrage with smaller, more broke ass nations. So, and I think there's enough of those. There's heaps of them in South America. There's heaps of them in the Eastern European bloc. There's the Middle East. There is Africa, of course. There's, there's all these places. So what we need to do is uh, try and create models of how we can build, you know, starting at a small scale, uh, you know, c communities that are at least self-sufficient enough that we can scale them up a little bit um, and, you know, maybe almost create like a franchise model. And I think on a slightly longer term, like me, my personal goal for the next couple of years is to build up amber as a, as a product because that, that's my core focus and I, and I want to get as many people to you know opt out of fiat and move into bitcoin as possible so that's sort of that stage the, the next stage of my life is i want to lay low i want to write some books you know and i want to sort of just get get off the fucking internet off twitter off all of this sort of stuff and just sort of lay low but after that like my, my future i think that the next decade of my life after my 40s is i actually think there's going to be big business in building cities and I would love to have a fucking franchise of cities that we sort of go around and we just buy shit and we, we, we develop. And, yeah, you, and that, I think, is the yeah. next trillion dollar industry. Yeah. Trillion you, set industry. There's this interview I did, um, this talk with uh, Stefanie and um, Titus Gable and Jeff Booth. It was a really amazing interview where, you know, Titus Gable is like the, the guy who brought the book Free Private Cities. Titus and, is, a, is a machine. I, I listened to that. Yeah. 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 Titus yeah. Is a machine. yeah. It's really amazing because I thought, you know, this is was actually the role of the government, if at all, you know, the government has a legitimacy to exist, but to provide, you know, protection and, and services. And why can't we just privatize everything? I mean, you know, and they could do it much more efficiently, much better and much cheaper, you know, deflationary prices uh, within that uh uh, you know, uh, community or, or you know, free, within the free private cities, whatever that is, you know, uh, uh, freedom and, and liberty and, and uh, security and uh, all of that, you know, and a free market. Just the, the, what you want to sort of picture these little free private cities as, it's a resort, but just a big version of a resort. And, and you know, you come to the resort and, you know, the, like, you're not going to get punched in the face by someone at the resort because, you know, there's security, for example. So it's like, you know, you, you and you pay a membership and you're a part of that. And, you know, you, you get your benefits for that membership. Now, if you want other things, just add to it. Um, if you don't want those other things, don't add to it. Um, you can, you know, you can add value to the resort so you can work there. Um, you know, you can set up a restaurant there or whatever and, you know, add like strengthen the economic, um, you know, mass of the, of the resort slash community slash city. But that, that, that is honestly, the, the, that's going to be the biggest business in the fucking world uh, as Bitcoin matures. Like building these new enclaves is going to be incredibly, incredibly profitable um, because that's where anyone with a brain is going to want to, to move. Anyone with money is going to want to move. And who do you want to sell to? Do, do you want to sell to the fucking person who's got five cents in his account or do you want to sell by Louis Vuitton back, you know, like that, that's, that's what we want to do. Like, and that's where I think the, the next great business opportunity is going to be. Yeah, exactly. 100% agree. And I don't just agree. Nope, I, would be, a comment on that. I, I would be more than happy to 
directly participate and cooperate when we discuss that because it's also my, my it's it's also a growing thought for me about uh, about this kind of scenario. I think that the the, the one of the concerns we have to have is how not to be shut down very early. Mm -hmm. And I think the more we stay pragmatic against the, the, the image yeah. Alex the, uh, gave of a resort is perfect. No, no one is going to be threatened by a resort. And no one is probably going to be to get threatened by five resorts of the same franchise with the same kind of uh, uh, holding infrastructure with some kind of charter connection. And, and while people may be threatened by uh, private island uh, sovereign and stuff like that. So let's let's keep it small. And the second concern would be to not be to not become like the enemy we are escaping from. For example, there is this kind of uh, naive libertarian pro market thinking which see, sees uh, the huge multinational company entrepreneur as the anti state hero like John Galt. But the problem with the John Galt image is that. If you are too big, if you are as big as John Galt, it doesn't matter how much libertarian you are, eventually you become a, a fucking statist because you just, that, that just becomes your interest. You are so, you are so, uh, set, you are so big that you are easy to shut down. And if you survive, you are, you are too easy to corrupt later on. So uh, is, um, I don't think that Mark Zuckerberg were very libertarian or, 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 or the other guys were very libertarian to begin with. But even when they are like Peter Thiel or, or other guys like that, uh, I mean, I hope Peter Thiel will, will just help out with uh, rebuilding civilization. But where, when you are that big uh, or even more Elon Musk, now everybody loves Elon Musk. I, I start to like the guy really. But when you are that big, you are very easy to shut down. And if you are not shut down, you are very easy to buy off uh, and, and, to, and to corrupt. So I think that we have to, the solution to this is to start low uh, and then scale up in a mostly decentralized way where, where you don't have an easy kill switch. So if you have a, if you have a, um, if you have a resort, you are too small to shut down. Uh, you, no, nobody cares. If you have a network of, of 10 resorts, then maybe it's better if no single individual can actually shut down the network of five. But if you have an 100, then it's even better. And when you are basically providing security to Kosovo, it's not really one guy providing the security which can be easily corrupted, but it's a de facto network. I think that the, a very good image would be uh, basically monasteries at the end of the, of the fall of the Roman Empire. If you think about that, the, the, the kind of collapse we are talking about is maybe similar for, uh, in some some uh, in some. Um, extent to the collapse of the uh, of the Soviet Union, but it's different because the Soviet Union were, were, was a collapse of one block with the other block winning basically and taking over and proliferating and providing the infrastructure, even the ideological infrastructure after the collapse. Uh, here we're talking about the collapse of the very center of the current fiat civilization, which may be more similar to the collapse of the Roman Empire actually, where you didn't have like another power taking over. You just have a disaggregation and you, you just have the barbarians taking over, but it's, it's not even, and there's not even anything to take over. Everything is collapsing. In that scenario, what is weeding, what is emerging uh, of uh, the people saving the civilization and also making a lot of good business because many monks, including the Templar Knights were pretty fucking rich because they were basically providing back the infrastructure that was missing. Unfortunately, Templar, Templar Knights were too centralized, and so they were actually easy to be shut down by one king. So to avoid the, the, the mistake of Templar Knights, we need to, uh, I mean, I am the first to, to, be, to, be, to, to, to mock and ridicule the decentralization hype as a buzzword, like everything decentralized from a technical point of view often doesn't make any sense. It's just a, it's just a, 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 a pretense game, it, it, it's not realistic. But the more, for, for example, we could not start building the resorts in a decentralized way, like everybody come here and everybody just build a bungalow and we have a resort. It doesn't work that, that way. We need some degree of centralization. Uh, we, centralization is useful because it's efficient. We need that. Mm -hmm. We just need to know when centralization is so dangerously uh, fragile that we have to sacrifice the gain in, in money efficiency in order to, to keep uh, anti-fragile the, 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 the goal we are achieving. 
So I think that, yeah, that kind of framework, like the, the resort is the perfect image of something which is realistic, achievable, not too triggering, to, to, to trigger a reaction immediately, and uh, very peaceful, and eventually able to scale up, not as a power structure, but as a protocol, a, a, a social protocol, basically. Well, I see some light at the end of the tunnel, <laughs> even though, you know, we've been discussing like real things that, that are going on right now, you know. So, you know, I don't see, I mean, to be honest, I don't see the future of, of myself, my girlfriend and our daughter in, in here. I mean, this is why, you know, um, I wanted to talk to you, like, what, what are the realistic options um, here? You know, what, what can we develop? But uh, I couldn't agree more with you. Uh, very beautifully said, Giacomo and Alex. So I assume you're going to be at the Miami conference. I don't think I'm going to make it, but I'll try. Um, so if you have any any things coming up, to, uh, where can people follow you? Any links, any articles, or um, any events? Uh, on my side, I had a website, but my BTC server, uh, Odroid, just collapsed, and I didn't care for it. Uh, it's just the, like, let's encrypt module I have to, uh, to reinstall it and I didn't. So right now I'm unreachable on my, on my new website, but I'm still on Twitter. So centralization is, uh, is more efficient than decentralization as always. And um, I, I, I- Hell of a drug. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I'm trying to make it to Miami. It's not, it's not sure I didn't check all the craziness about uh, entering the United States. I know that there will be a conference uh, organized by the Ugly All Goats in Mexico uh, in August. So I will probably try Miami and maybe uh, going to some other places in Central uh, in Central America during July, but uh, sorry June. But if I fail uh, with with the family, we will probably reach Mexico for uh, the uh, Hug the All Goat uh, conference in August. Sounds exciting, Alex. How about you? Awesome. Uh, me uh, Twitter as well. Um, uh centralization is a hell of a drug so i'm on there but i i've started writing a new series of um of articles that are looking at bitcoin through the lens of jordan peterson's work so it's, it's called the the 12 rules for bitcoin series and and basically you know i i think his his work is obviously you know it's incredible it's inspired a lot of people blah 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 but you know i'm kind of taking all the the things that i've learned throughout life and kind of drawing on themes uh, in his lessons. So the first one is, it's called, um, Bitcoin territory and Bitcoin hierarchy and territory. And it's sort of like a, a discussion about how Bitcoin enables, uh, hierarchies of competence to once again, uh, emerge as opposed to fiat hierarchies of, um, of dictatorship and of incompetence. And, um, and <clears throat> the, the second one is called Bitcoin chaos and order. We're sort of delving into some other deeper topics and things like that. So, so that's kind of, where a lot of my time's going and and yeah uh still working hard on amber and as i said uh, the the long-term vision here is to to think about uh how do we how do we build these resorts and then how do we turn these resorts into a model for you know the w what i believe in the future is going to be a a customer service provider relationship as opposed to a subject overlord relationship that we have today. And, you know, the, the sooner we sort of move into that kind of a world, I think the, the better for many of us. Yeah, I mean, I'd be the first one to join your community, oh. guys. <laughs> so hope to see you guys in person. Um, if not, maybe next time. So thank you so much again. And, you know, it was I had really a blast with you guys. Talk to you soon, all right? Always. Thanks, Kevin. Thanks, Giacomo. Thanks, Alex, Giacomo. Uh, thanks, Bye, Alex. My pleasure. Bye. Ciao, uh, amigos. Okay, that was a. I really had a blast every time with Alex Giacomo. Um, Eric Vasco should have uh, come, but maybe he he's gonna join us next time. And uh, Yuri de Gaia. So uh, yeah, the reason you know I wanted to, this talk is like, what are the scenarios that's gonna play out? What are the what are the options we have? How is the nation state, the government, the military industrial intelligence complex gonna react to you know being threatened? Uh, you know, the, the sort of the, the control being taken away from them gradually, maybe even suddenly. Like, how are they gonna react? Because right now we are so early. We are like still probably in the honeymoon phase of two to 3% mass adoption globally. 
and um, yeah so um, make sure you know just stack sats hodl uh, keep you know take care of your privacy your security and uh, eventually you know it will it will it just this process of hyper bitcoinization is going to take place one way or another i mean the the the, the pace of, of speed the rate of speed is taking place on the second layer third layer lightning and and as a medium of exchange, you know, and eventually as a unit account and global settlement layer, it's going to take time, but a bit until then, it will just, you know, grow by order of magnitude in purchasing power. And this is what's, I think, most important for people to understand. It's the purchasing power. So, uh, yeah, it was, I, I really enjoyed this talk. Let me know your questions, your comments, or any suggestions for any future panel discussions. My name is Kevan Devani. I'm the host of the Kevan Devani Connection Show. And make sure you subscribe to YouTube channel and podcast platform and follow me, follow me and follow uh, Alexander Swetsky and Giacomo Zocco on Twitter. They have amazing, you know, uh, phenomenal content uh, putting out there. It's just, uh, it's just mind boggling. So thank you so much again, and I'll see you soon. Bye.